Hello, everyone. I'm going to give a second to hopefully everyone has a seat. There are a couple extras. Um, if you want to use this time to stretch your legs, that's totally all good, too. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. For those of you who are here at BLGS and for those of you who are joining through Zoom. Uh, my name is Alana Ojibwe. I'm the Assistant Director here at the Center for Justice Reform at BLGS. This event is actually the launch of our Center for Justice Reform speaker series, and we could not be more grateful to be kicking off this event with guest speaker, Dr. John Braith White. I'll further introduce Dr. Braith White in just a moment, but wanted to first share just a few housekeeping notes. Um, we will have some time at the end for about 15 minutes of questions, so please just keep those um, for the end. And for those who are joining on Zoom, feel free to add those in the chat anytime. We'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Um, and then following the lecture, we'll have um, some time for refreshments and further discussion in smaller groups and more informal. So we invite you to stay after this as well for that. So Dr. John Braithwaite is a research professor at the University of Maryland and a marriage professor at the Australian National University, where he's the founder of the School of Regulation and Global Governance, or REGNET, the Center for Restorative Justice, and Canberra Restorative Communities. Dr. Braithwaite is recognized as one of the world's most influential scholars in both criminology and sociolegal studies, as well as many other areas of research, including restorative justice, responsive regulation, corporate crime, peace building, delinquency, and global business regulation. As an author of 27 books and 200 journal publications, John's research has continued to offer truly visionary examples looking at the intersectionality between different fields and global issues, one of those being this link between restorative justice and responsive regulation for environmental harms that we'll be discussing today. John has been a champion for justice for over 40 years, and his expertise offers so many lessons and inspiration for our community of students, staff, and faculty here at BLGS who are dedicated to improving social and environmental issues of injustice. Dr. Brace White, we welcome you to Vermont Law Graduate School and are so grateful for this opportunity to hear and learn from you today. Thanks for that kind introduction, uh, Alana. Uh, uh, first, I'd uh, like to pay my respects to the Abnaki people, the uh, traditional owners of this land, as we say in Australia, uh, always was, always will be Indigenous land. And I'd also like to uh, pay my respects and acknowledgement to uh, the uh, elders of the Center for Justice Reform, uh, to Bobby, Stephanie, Jessica, and the whole the whole team here, and I really have enjoyed the hospitality of coming back to uh, Vermont. Uh, Vermont, after all, has for a long time been at the healing edge of the global movement for restorative justice, uh, and Galbert, as well as Alain, were in, involved uh, in persuading me to come here, and that there, there are few parts of the world that can claim uh, as inspiring uh, a leader of the uh, uh, research community on restorative justice as uh, as Gail has been and continues to be. And uh, it's been so great in the last uh, year or so to meet uh, uh, Alana, uh, such a great. Uh, new generation Indigenous leader of, of the movement, uh, from whom I've been learning so much. Uh, so thank, thank, uh, thank you all, and to uh, so many others. Uh, you know, married to this, your institution has as strong a collection of environmental lawyers as we can find in probably any uh, university in the world. So my topic is uh, the right one for today, I, I, I think, given all of that. Uh, where to stand on interpreting abolitionism? 
is a big issue in the contemporary restorative justice. One challenge is that with environmental harms, greater use of criminal law enforcement may be one of the things most needed. While we may need a lot more criminal prosecution than we have, that doesn't mean that restorative justice people who believe we should empty our prisons of so many black lives that matter, uh, we shouldn't necessarily fill them up again with environmental criminals. Uh, it's instructive to follow China's trajectory on these issues in recent years. As in the West, China has been disappointed so far uh, with how much effect putting a price on carbon has had on, on their uh, climate change uh, challenges, the massive contribution uh, they make to uh, the global problem. Uh, Meta-analyses of carbon pricing uh, effects uh, shows that Putting a price on carbon works, uh, but with less of an effect, with the effect sizes that are smaller uh, than economic theory would predict that it should have. Three reasons for this might be carbon fraud, regulatory and political capture, and corruption. A problem uh, is that the higher the price of carbon, the larger the incentive for carbon fraud, uh, the larger the incentive for bribing uh, the environmental inspector who might detect that fraud. Uh, this century, one Chinese response has been literally to put corrupt heads of regulatory agencies in front of a firing squad. Now, I'm not advocating that for the United States, I think rushed to emphasize it, but I do think. Uh, that a more robust response is needed to dealing with captured and corrupt regulators and the holistic restorative regulation of the environmental crisis means rolling into that more effective regular, uh, uh, regulation of regulators who fail to meet their regulatory responsibility through capture or corruption. Uh, so what should be uh, that response, uh, that more robust response that I'm thinking of? Well, of course, I'm going to argue that restorative justice might have something to contribute uh, uh, there. Uh, another response uh, to the problem of captured and corrupt environmental regulators was for China to encourage its uh, regional police departments to take over the criminal law enforcement responsibilities from the specialist environmental regulators, set up specialist environmental enforcement units within police departments. Uh, and in, indeed, that has been uh, rolled out uh, across China since that initiative was announced uh, in 2017. And I'm not recommending that as a response to the United States or any other country, but it reflects a reality that China keeps thinking and changing about these matters more than we are uh, in, uh, in the West. And in some ways it shows that while they are the biggest contributors uh, to climate change, they're also being more innovative in how they're thinking of the regulatory and law part of their uh, response to it. So as a result of that change announced in 2017, in the first year, the number of uh, arrests uh, for uh, environmental offenders increased by 52% in China between, uh, 19, between 2017 and 2018. And that's been on a trajectory of increasing the risk. And that amounts to uh, more than 15,000 individuals since 2018. Being arrested for quite a lot of uh, arrests for uh, criminal offences. Processing that kind of huge wave of environmental offenders caused a system capacity crisis, even for China. Uh, so the Chief Justice of, of China recently gave a speech in which he said, 
perhaps what we need to do is more restorative justice in processing uh, our environmental uh, offences. One of my PhD uh, students who's Chinese, uh, Yang Chung, uh, has just completed what would be a wonderful book and I uh, recommend it to you, in which he argues that uh, China has the largest restorative justice program in the world, but at the same time, it is a resistor of restorative justice. So let me say a little bit about what he means uh, uh, by, uh, by, by that. So in terms of the scale of what they're doing in China since their 2012 announcement of a, a criminal mediation approach to mediation that a, a, a softening of its uh, former strike hard policy uh, to criminal law, which has included a, a sharp reduction in the use of capital punishment. Um, what, what we've had is uh, millions of mediators being trained across China, uh, tens of millions of mediation every year, uh, where a substantial proportion of them uh, meet whatever definition of restorative justice we might want to adhere to. Uh, and every year, more than 10 million cases of those cases, which are, are, are actually criminal. Uh, mediations, if, if we count, at least if we count the criminal mediations initiated, initiated by judges after a diet. So the case comes to before the judge, and the judge said, Why don't we go and sit around the table and uh, see you sitting in the circle and you come up with a mediator solution to this problem? And you know, you'd be surprised to know that not in Xinjiang, where the oppression of Muslim people is so profound. But in other parts of China, where there are large Muslim populations, they will invite the mullah into the circle and, and, and allow, uh, uh, you know, illegal pluralism of various kinds and a lot of empowerment of indigenous justice. Part of Jan's PhD thesis, yeah, working with the Dagu indigenous majority of some six or seven million people within China, where they are allowed to use uh, the Dagu. Uh, justice uh, system uh, without participation of the Communist Party in the devolved uh, uh, justice. So uh, it might be the largest restorative justice program in the world, but it might also be the thinnest. <laughs> it's not thick restorative uh, uh, justice. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's no significant social movement for restorative justice in China in the way there is in every Western country that I know, and certainly a very strong one in this, and this country, and I'm the one to argue that's really important and missing in China. Yang yeah, gets uh, criticised that, oh, what you're talking about in China is not really restorative uh, justice. Um, uh, when he's scolded uh, by Western restorative justice advocates, uh, for, you know, with, you know, you shouldn't call Chinese people mediation or their indigenous mediations either, or their regulatory uh, environmental mediation of restorative justice, restorative justice, because it's imposed by an authoritarian state. Uh, he replies, and gives a very interesting reply, he says, well, I see Chinese restorative justice as a restorative discourse in the making. And not all our restorative justice discourses uh, discourses uh, uh, in the making. The Chinese one has really been in the making for 2,500 years, you might say, since the time of Confucius. Uh, Young's refusal to be anxious about his Chinese restorative standpoint on this question it goes to a worry I have about restorative advocacy in Australia and in the United States. It's that advocates are not as open as they could be to a softer line uh, concerning their orthodoxies. We need to be deeper listeners to other restorative advocates who challenge our orthodoxies. Our, our restorative values require us to be relationally engaged with those having different restorative imaginaries from our own. Uh, what Nancy uh, 
as it is Jetson calls, fidelity anxiety is a problem in our movement. I often, you know, when I'm traveling around the place, I become a restorative elder. I have, I have younger restorative practitioners come up to me and describe to me step by step exactly what they do. And they will explain to me that why they're doing that is they want me to say back to them that they're sustaining a fidelity to restorative justice uh, values. And I normally do want to do that. And even if I disagree with aspects of uh, the, the practice choices they have decided to make, I'll say, you know, you know they're all very restorative. And uh, we all have fidelity and anxiety. We all have this worry in the restorative justice movement that someone's going to out our practices for not being as restorative as they, uh, as they really should be. But we're a learning uh, social movement. We're always on a journey of learning from others, uh, uh, including others in countries like China, where our propensity is to stigmatize uh, some of the good things uh, that, they, uh, that they, they do. We are a principled social movement, and we have principles that we need to stand by and articulate and explain to each other. But being principled does not mean that we don't have an obligation to be careful about not giving our innovators coming up from other places of the younger generation uh, from being innovative. We certainly need a restorative justice movement that embraces abolitionists, uh, but also people who uh, want to see more, more criminal punishment of certain kinds and who simultaneously favour uh, certain kinds of restorative justice within the state or others who want restorative justice to be fully within civil society. We can embrace all of those currents of thought. In fact, it's so important if restorative justice is to be effective, and I would say for environmental justice to be effective, for the restorative justice movement to be a broad church, a broad mosque, a broad temple. For example, all factions of the restorative justice movement probably do agree that restorative justice in schools is a good thing and important for whatever branch, uh, whatever specialization of restorative justice is our particular uh, area of, of, of interest. Uh, restorative justice in schools is a much bigger phenomenon than restorative justice in the criminal justice system, regulatory practice, and, and in everything else, really. And I was amazed to see, since I've been here in the United States, the US Justice Department recently put out a new report uh, that demonstrated the growth of restorative justice in schools in this country. In 2017, 30% uh, of schools, if you say, are uh, 12. 12, K-12, K-12, K-12 schools, 30% uh, had restorative justice programs of some kind in 2007. By this year, 2022, that had increased to 60%. So there's a huge uh, takeoff. And from my analysis, schools is the most important. I'd rather see restorative justice growing like that in schools than in the justice system. Um, but I think schools can, school by school, but it's each individual school make a choice as to whether the restorative justice program that you can add value to their education program and if you substantiate uh, uh, suspensions, uh, uh, reduce bullying, and so on, and improve education uh, outcomes. And, you know, the China problem of not having a social movement for restorative justice is a problem of not being a democracy and being an authoritarian state. But children are not born democratic. They have to learn to be democratic. And they learn to be democratic. They learn to be environmental uh, uh, advocates. They, they learn to be animal rights uh, advocates uh, in schools. Uh, and children, commit more often than we care to admit 
uh, lots of tiny crimes against the environment. Uh, you know, cruel killing of animals. Uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of us did that. That sort of experimental uh, cruel killing. You see what happens when you kill a lizard and this sort of this sort of thing. And this is a this is a great thing for a story of justice to engage with in, in schools. And uh, you know, there are terrible crimes against the environment. There are little crimes against the environment. We respond to them more effectively when we start by responding to the little crimes, where it's really not so controversial uh, to respond to them in a restorative way. Of course, there are there are political contests in schools about students in Australia often come under pressure from their principals when they go on to on strike for the climate uh, day of strike you have that in the US where all the kids walk out of school and go and march down the middle of the capital and with banners about climate change. Did you have that? No. <laughs> anyhow, anyhow that that causes conflict in school. So a politicised story of justice conference in the school about whether it's right or wrong to suspend your edu education for the day to join the climate strike is a, uh, is, is, is also a, a restorative circle where the children need to talk about how we could improve uh, the environmental impact of our school buildings. And is it really necessary for our new school, school building to have air conditioning? Could we put one of those? giant sucking devices in the roof and our fans? Could we have a green wall? Uh, could we manage without the air conditioning? After all, that makes also makes it safe for, uh, for COVID. And these, these kinds of uh, uh, debates that children are very well, well equipped to have and engaged in the local realities of their local school environment. Uh, since the 1970s, I've spent a lot of time hanging out with uh, US uh, law school members of the Corporate Crime Academy. Uh, deferred prosecution agreements have grown steeply since the Arthur Anderson prosecution over its auditing of Enron drove Arthur Anderson into bankruptcy. Uh, the US economy became more monopolized after the collapse of Arthur Anderson. Uh, what had been a big five accounting firms became a big four when I was a, a young corporate crime scholar, it was a big eight. Uh, the biggest appeal of deferred prosecution agreements to the Justice Department has been that it's a response to their system capacity crisis with managing mega corporate crime cases, each one of which requires huge legal resources, uh, including the environmental ones. The corporate tax evasion is the form of crime on my way of viewing it, uh, where the enforcement capacity crisis has always been deepest and where early on mediated corporate integrity agreements voluntarily pay up more tax, um, improve corporate tax compliance systems have long been the norm and criminal prosecution very rare. So, to my way of looking at it, the corporate crime, restorative justice is, in a way, in a kind of way, being certainly mediated justice being in the mainstream. Um, and if tax is also an area where, uh, more broadly, a relational approach to enforcement of corporate law has, has, has been a big thing in Australia for a long time. So the biggest corporate taxpayer uh, has a, an officer of a, a permanent inspector who has a desk within the corporate headquarters, who's living and breathing the corporate culture and talking to them on a daily basis about their corporate system. And, and that approach in uh, companies and securities law, uh, you now see in many countries, and actually you have a long history of it in the United States with uh, coal mine safety uh, laws. And they, they worked, by the way. So, you know, way back in the late 70s, the Mine Safety and Health Administration started a resident inspector program in the 78 coal mines in the United States with the worst accident and death rate record 
for uh, miners. And after the resident inspectors were put in again, to live and breathe the safety culture of that mine and to relationally engage with the corporate safety people, the union safety people, uh, those 78 mines ended up being, being below average in lost time accidents and deaths on, on the job. So relational regulation uh, does work because the essence of restorative justice is being relational about how we bring about uh, change and legal compliance. Most of my friends in the Corporate Crime Academy, the Environmental Crime Academy, believe that the growth of deferred prosecution agreements is a scandal of under-enforcement. And I agree with that, uh, but I'm inclined to see it as a scandal of quick and dirty justice that's insufficiently restorative and insufficiently demanding of corporate offenders. What I'd like to see is a huge R&D effort on how to make deferred prosecution agreements more effective for environment, environmental crimes, for corporate crime more wider, and for street crimes as well. Uh, uh, you know, in the United Kingdom, they're doing uh, some you know, impressive empirical studies on the effectiveness of deferred prosecution agreements with street crime. Um, but that's my topic, not my topic for today. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying this is deferred prosecution agreements is only for corporate. How am I going to? I best skip over the next bit. Being too long winded, John. Now I I know that you're having you know, prosecutor hardcastle here on Friday to talk to you, which should be really great. I might advertise his talk, but also I hope steal his thunder and generate some uh, some provocative. Questions because I think his case is such an instructive one uh, for my topic today. Most of you probably know quite a bit about the case, and that's what makes it a good example to use because you've either seen the uh, net, the terrific Netflix uh, series uh, Dope Sick or you've read about uh, the Sacklers and per Purdue Pharma stories in the media. It's not an environmental law case. Though, if we had reduced overconsumptions of opiates, uh, uh, there, there, there would be a, a lot less uh, environmental harm being created by the, by the, by the uh, chemical industry if they were producing less of those ingredients. Um, Purdue Pharma, um, uh, in, in that case that prosecutor Hardcastle ran, uh, there were quite senior criminal convictions. Uh, the chief, chief executive was, was convicted of a major global crime. That's very unusual in any country. Uh, the chief medical officer was convicted. I don't know of any other case, big pharma case, with that. Um, there might be. The chief legal officer of Purdue was convicted of criminal. That's very unusual. Um, and the corporation was convicted uh, criminal. But in my opinion, it would be interesting to hear what someone who really knows something about the subject has to say on Friday, but in my opinion, as an outsider looking in, as senior as these people were, uh, they are inclined to see them as people who were paid well uh, to be four guys. Uh, none of the Sackler family members who were the masterminds of the corporate strategy were convicted. When I was doing my uh, research on corporate crime in the pharmaceutical industry long ago, I found three American corporations which had top executives with very odd titles. And I was such a what does that title mean? It seems like gobbledygook. I said, oh yeah, it was meant to be gobbledygook because He's the vice president responsible for going to jail. That is to say, <laughs> lines of accountability had been built. So if the CEO was exposed, this guy would put up his hand and say, yeah, I abstracted the battery farm. Yeah, it had nothing to do with the CEO. And after a period of faithful service as a vice president for going to jail, you would get promoted sideways to a safe uh, vice presidency. So that's not a new phenomenon. Uh, 
The later uh, Purdue trials effectively shut down Purdue as a pillar corporation. Uh, that was a huge success of incapacitation of a corporate criminal organisation. The 2020 bankruptcy settlement and more than a thousand suits against Purdue uh, resulted in an $8.3 billion payout. Uh, and, and that at least turned off the illicit flow of wealth to the Sackler family. But the family remained one of the wealthiest in the country. Uh, according to the most recent court judgments, the Sacklers managed to siphon off around $11 billion from Purdue to family members, or rather to their tax havens before the Purdue uh, uh, bankruptcy. So I want to summarize this case in terms of big achievements that were, uh, you know, I would say remarkably good. Uh, compared to what usually happens with big environmental crimes or any kind of big corporate uh, crime, but also the big failures that were not achieved uh, so that we can open our minds uh, to imagine uh, whether there would be a way of keeping the good things that were accomplished in the Purdue case and moving beyond them to a more holistic kind of a uh, uh, of, of enforcement that achieved the other things that were on which there was failure. So, for the Sackler, uh, the, not the Sackler prosecution, for the Purdue prosecution, uh, the CEO, Chief Medical Officer of the Corporation, General Counsel, uh, go down against no Sacklers uh, convicted, not even an admission of wrongdoing, but we didn't ever do it wrong. Uh, the Sacklers were allowed by all the law enforcement to get away with saying we, we really did nothing wrong. Mm, shocking. Uh, four, which side was four? This is the four side. Uh, four, uh, uh, bankruptcy of old, the old Purdue Corporation, so it's no longer capable of continuing to fill people. Uh, against the, the Sack Sacklers, $11 billion of the Sackler fortune is uh, salvaged. Four, a total of some $9 billion, so much money in uh, uh, payouts. Uh, against, uh, these were mostly organisational plaintiffs, uh, state governments. Uh, they were most of the little people uh, who were the victims, uh, were, were not paid out. The families who were suffered were, who were suffered were not be helped by this uh, nine billion dollars by and large. Four, the FDA learned some lessons from what happened. Far too late, after the horse had bolted, uh, they did uh, put new regulatory impositions on Purdue to make sure that it was, uh, uh, you know, to make it difficult to use the product uh, for. Uh, for purposes other than legal prescriptions and to fuel, fuel the opioid epidemic. Uh, but unfortunately, this is also too late because while it was an effective regulatory intervention that made the grinding of the OxyContin pills no longer, uh, uh, you know, so, so the taking of the OxyContin pills no longer so effective, they managed to mix it in with heroin so that you know, the, the shocking accomplishment of OxyContin was that people who found repulsive the idea of injecting heroin were able to take opioids by, you know, by taking this OxyContin stuff without having to inject. But having become addicted through, through the gateway of OxyContin, they're then so in need of the hit that they're willing to go to heroin once FDA closed that door. So FDA closed the regulatory door, sadly. Uh, uh, too late. In light of these dilemmas, I, I think Western democracies need to become uh, bolder in their leadership than China has been. There's some massive structural shifts in how we do corporate criminal law. We need a more responsive legal system where the Justice Department could and would encourage prosecution and defence lawyers from all the criminal cases and all the civil cases to agree to refer a structurally 
a passive criminal corporation like Purdue or Enron or Exxon uh, or one of the big four accounting firms to a restorative process. The aim of such a, 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 a mega process uh, for uh, uh, corporate restorative justice would be to see if consensus can be reached among all the parties and then submitted for approval by all the judges in such cases that were already headed toward trial. Effectiveness for that kind of process in delivering this depends, I suggest, on our research community knuckling down to the R&D on how we infuse social movement voice and the voice of little people, common victims, into restorative law processes. So I'm arguing that that's, that's a bit of the problem with the, 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 the Purdue Pharma case. Uh, I could illustrate if I had time with environmental crime, corporate environmental crimes in Australia that gave us an opportunity to prevent something as serious as the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the United States. That was not accomplished by our environmental regulator. It could only have been accomplished if social movement actors who cared about the global environment were in a restorative circle, or I can't think of any other way of doing it, and who would have said in that case, after the Timor seal, sea oil spill, which was had been sealed a year earlier uh, than Deepwater Horizon by the Halliburton Corporation, and uh, spilled uncapped oil into the Timor Sea for 76 days, almost the same amount of time as Deepwater Horizon, for exactly the same reason, at the hands of exactly the same corporate malefactor, Halliburton Corporation, that to demand the social movement demand for Halliburton worldwide to produce an, a public audit report on what it's going to do to fix up the basis of all of those all of those oil platforms, it's one of the two biggest, two big, Halliburton and one other company account for almost all of the sealing of the basis of offshore oil reefs around the world. So that's how big and obvious it was that that sort of restorative preventive approach should have taken place in, in, that, uh, in that case. So that's the potential, but the potential is not going to be realized uh, by, uh, prosecutors or by regulators, prosecutors uh, in the Chinese case uh, that Yan study were the least responsive to the restorative shift. And the reason is that prosecutors in China are a bit like prosecutors in the West in that they have two big concerns. One is they're managing a system capacity crisis with crimes on the street and, and with corporate crime like that sort of managing it mainly by quick and dirty plea bargains. Uh, and they, they don't have the imagination to see other ways of handling that system capacity crisis. And they're also worried about political uh, criticism. Uh, I uh, to throw out to Gail and their audience on, on Zoom by saying, if you think about child protection workers are a bit like prosecutors in that. We go. They have a system capacity crisis. They are worried about making uh, a mistake where if a, a child dies and the, they will they will cop the political. I suppose so. They're a bit, uh, bit, bit really, they're very cautious about uh, sweeping reform, which would require uh, you know family group decision making of the type that uh, uh, Gail and Joan Pinnell uh, pioneer, uh, pioneered. So I think a jurisprudential shift is needed that where the courts are, are, are empowered are in common law jurisdictions, seize the power, as it were, to lay down some principles in crucial judgments that say, well, um, you have to, if you're going to do a deferred prosecution, agreement or if you're going to do something as dramatic as to steal another baby from an indigenous 
uh, a community from an indigenous mother. That's such a big decision that we expect from you uh, a justification that you have been through a family good decision making process where all of the stakeholders, where advocacy groups who support the stakeholders, Indigenous elders in the Indigenous case have a voice uh, in, the, in the restorative uh, uh, process. Uh, in the deferred prosecution case with the mega environmental crime or with a Purdue Pharma uh, kind of case, uh, demonstrate, yes, do the mega prosecution deal, include in that mega prosecution deal, uh, extracting agreements from the FDA leaders who should resign. So I'm connecting back to that earlier point that nothing was done about that problem. And what happened there was pretty shocking. Uh, remember that the FDA officer, pretty middle ranking kind of guy who approved the marketing uh, arrangements for uh, OxyContin gets a job uh, paying about four times his FDA salary. Now, Whoever, you know, uh, oversighting that guy, allowing that to happen, uh, accountability needs to be demanded of these uh, regulatory officials in cases like this, if there's going to be real policy learning and real change in the regulatory agency. That's what I mean. We don't, we don't have to go the, the, the way of the Chinese and say, ah, oh, these regulatory agencies are always going to be captured and cut corrupted by big business, so we have to give this to the, to the police to up the funding of the police to take care of environment. There are other parts, and the, um, I'm advocating the restorative uh, part uh, here. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I've said this already, that the key missing element in deferred prosecution agreements is uh, uh, is, is getting that social movement uh, engagement. Uh, though, often a deal has to be done with a narrower circle first. We see that with the use of restorative peace building in international relations. So step one in getting a ceasefire and a peace process working often has to be just done with the big boys who are holding all the guns. So, you know, if we're to get peace in Ukraine, for example, uh, step one, we might have to imagine a meeting between uh, Putin, Zelensky and, and, and Biden, agreeing to the terms of a ceasefire with just them in the room saying very sensitive things about the, you know, Mr. Putin would have to say, some things about presumably about well you're hoping that there'll be a coup but I'm telling you if there's a coup there'll be people worse than me in the Russian military who'll take over and they're able to say each other these sort of things to each other in ceasefire uh, agreements that kind of step one which is not inclusive of civil society politics is often needed to get the initial ceasefire uh, in place. But then what good peace processes do is widen the circle. So there's transparency and meaningful democratic participation uh, of the peoples affected by the war, uh, mediated responsibly sometimes by the United Nations, sometimes in civil society and second track diplomacy. As we've seen with many peace processes in recent history, with varying degrees of success. But statistically, on average, peace, peace agreement processes do work in ending wars, shortening them, reducing the deaths from wars. Even the most fervent militarists now agree that had the United States reach a peace settlement with the Taliban, rather than continuing to hunt them down, there were promising windows for a peace agreement in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2005, 2009, 2010. If a peace agreement had been reached with the Taliban at any of those moments when the United, the United States and NATO could have negotiated from a position of greater strength, 
And there had also been a participatory peace agreement with participation of the women's movement in the peace process. At any one of those times, we would have had an outcome that would have delivered better guarantees of a right to education for girls in Afghanistan than they currently have, have less starvation and more participatory governance than Afghanistan currently suffers, and less blood and treasure so wastefully drained from your beloved country. Tragically, the last time I spoke at this university 21 years ago, well, it was the University of Vermont 21 years ago, uh, that was the very restorative agenda in Afghanistan on which I spoke. I'm hoping that the special jurisdiction for peace of the Colombian judiciary uh, will continue to succeed in extracting uh, formal Oh, I'm running out of time, aren't I? Uh, formal peace to go to say. So they're, 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 they in, uh, they in Colombia are the healing edge of peace processes where, where they're, um, uh, they, they have a thing called restorative sanctions. Uh, and, and what they've accomplished is the entire Central Committee, with a couple of exceptions of the FARC, and many generals uh, admitting to crimes against humanity. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that scale has not been possible for prosecutorial criminal prosecution approach uh, in the, in the past. It's the restorative element. It's the participation of the victims movement in that process that's making uh, that. So environmental lawyers should be watching that space to learn from it. Environmental lawyers can learn from. Uh, Australia, the biggest case we ever took when I was a regulatory commissioner in Australia was against Australia's biggest corporation of the time, transacted restoratively uh, with representatives of 300,000 victims of the crime. It extracted the biggest payouts we achieved to them in the fine, the biggest penalties, and structural corporate compliance reforms. Uh, and, and with a, a restorative environmental and criminal law, in Australia and New Zealand. It's grown more slowly, uh, but is certainly uh, growing. Uh, I've, uh, uh, I think I've read already sufficiently made the point of rolling into the process accountability for the regulators uh, as well. Uh, so legal justice, whether it's about uh, Gail Burford's work on child sexual abuse, or environmental justice will continue to fail unless it finds a pathway to give the survivors and their families voice to check and balance the cozy people prosecutors and powerful criminals tend to do. Indigenous custodians of rivers as flows of life must be given much more voice in, uh, uh, in water pollution uh, cases as we've just begun to do in Australia and New Zealand. No more deferred prosecution agreements where corporate offenders like the Sacklers get away with saying, we didn't do it, but we won't do it again. Uh, to respond to that challenge, uh, I commend environmental restorative justice to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. So we'll um, open it up now. I'll keep an eye on the our, our Zoom attendees. If there's questions, feel free to put those in the chat, and we'll open it up if anyone if anyone wants to kick off with some questions. Thank you, John. Um, you sort of alluded to this, but I wanted to come back to it to see what you think of this. Where can the sort of justice make its most uh, profound impact in environmental criminal matters? If you, if you work backwards from, say, pick a, you could give us examples of major environmental crimes, deep water horizon, BP oil spill, Bridgeport has the thousands of oil spill, in Indian country, uranium mining is sort of left unattended, et cetera. If we work backwards from that moment, where at what point in the life cycle of a criminal, what something has become a criminal matter, might have been, you know, a tort matter, might have been an administrative law matter, might have been a contract matter. And so as we go back, at a certain point, we're going to get to a zone where it's, the question was more political. 
that it was legal. That at some point we made a decision to allow fossil fuel development to even happen. So a lot of that happens without the the the, the you know, scare the public on them. Like public utilities work, so much of their work happens without us knowing much about you know. Well, we just locked in a forty-year contract for use of coal, and so that means that renewables are going to get shut out of that. So we don't need to wait for the harm to happen twenty years later or even five years later because the damage is already done. We got locked into a contract that kind of pushes and uses the market. So where can restorative justice be most effective in the life cycle before actual harms? I don't think there's a right place about which one can say cut here first, because you, you've got to cut where the opportunities are. And before all of that, I would of course say that the most important place to start with environmental restorative justice is, is that democratic consciousness to be a green activist in this group. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and I think, you know, there are common law countries where their Supreme Courts have declared restorative justice a principle of sentencing for criminal law. And there are other long standing doctrines. If you take the problem of child sexual assault, for example, I have another uh, PhD student, uh, Meredith Williams, looked at, you know, which types of law are most and least effective in response to points. You know, it's sort of a little question, what's the point of entry that works best? And you know, the you know, the one that's been worse, which you might have had higher hopes for, is canon law. So, you know, you might think that you know it's canon law is a, a law of the church, a law of love, and so that would create restorative spaces. But jurisprudentially it's actually a law whose most fundamental principles uh, is that crime is a crime against God. The church is God's instrument on earth. So, you know, it's pretty fundamental to, uh, 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 to, to canon law that you protect the church more than that you're responsive to victims. So, you know, it sort of comes at the bottom of her list. And you know one of the ones that come really high on her list? It's uh, US bankruptcy law. So there have been these cases, you know, where, uh, 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 what's what's the word, Catholic dioceses in the United States have filed for bankruptcy. And bankruptcy law has long been doctrinally prescriptive in saying, you must give voice to creditors and we in the courts will oversight the work of the liquidator do you call them liquidators or do you call them administrators in bankruptcy, whatever you call them, uh, to uh, ensure uh, that all, all of the different types of creditors have been listened to in the process. So they, they can be in informal mediation where the creditors speak up and say, well, that, that, that proposal for how we carve up the, uh, the remains, the carcass of the corporation uh, for which of the church properties uh, the church is required to sell in the bankruptcy deal is unacceptable to us. So uh, we have found that, you know, uh, in the best cases, you know, you, you had non-financial agreements coming out of bankruptcy law where the, where the, the church diocese would say, we, we, we will hold a special Sunday service where the bishop will apologize for everything that has happened. We will not say, uh, we didn't do it and we won't do it again. We'll say our priest uh, did do it and we will, and we did cover it up and we will put in place uh, these preventive policies to ensure. And, you know, not just in the Catholic churches, but in many uh, churches and other state institutions where there was systematic uh, abuse of children, there have been some uh, productive uh, uh, responses of that kind. So what we want in a way is doctrinal change in I think common law systems uh, where the highest courts are saying, well, you know, we kind of like that about bankruptcy law and we're going to require it in child protection law as well. So if you can't show that you put in place a family group uh, conference 
And so it's possible with members of the indigenous community of that family to have the say about why it would be better for the elders to take over uh, the process of, of negotiating what will be done to make sure that this child is safe in that uh, family. And likewise with a mega deal, like could have gone beyond what was accomplished by prosecutors like Mr. Hardcastle to something bigger and more ambitious and transform the FDA as well as which was so new, as well as transforming uh, and transforming big pharma as, as as a whole. So the opioid epidemic epidemic just didn't continue in other ways with another company that does similar things with fentanyl, which becomes even worse and builds uh, builds on the evils of the past with new new evils of the of the future. So you know if you had a radical change in doctrine so that the courts were saying you need to demonstrate to us that these civil society stakeholders were listened to and if you don't i'm going to strike down the order uh, to seize that child and that mother i'm going to strike down the order for a payout of, of eight billion dollars that leaves the sacklers with 11 billion no not with Uh, back to uh, what when, when a harm does occur and you're say representing a community or, or someone who was who was harmed against a uh, corporation um, and kind of using like a ceasefire like with, with the war you're referencing um, does that does that uh, ceasefire have to come through like in your experience does it usually have to come through a court you know if you're representing uh, someone that's harmed from pollution, um, or are there other good ways to like open that door to, to establish that circle of that you know, accountability? Well, in, in war, you know, most usually the early progress occurs through track two diplomacy, which is not the Putin's and Biden's and Zelensky's, but the, the, the lower level people talking to each other and then saying to people higher up, you know. This kind of deal would fly with them, um, and uh, uh, and that kind of deal would result in a reaction, which in my you know might include escalation of Armageddon. So maybe maybe don't keep pushing that particular envelope. Um, uh, you know, so uh, you know sometimes they occur purely top down, but more often uh, whether they're peace agreements or radical transformative solutions for corporate regulation in a, in a, in a country that they, they, they more often start in civil society. And with peace agreements, the evidence is very clear that you always have eight or nine failed attempts to get a peace agreement up before you have one succeed. It's like trying to give up cigarettes. If you're serious about giving them up, you will succeed uh, after eight or nine tries, but you won't succeed after two or three uh, tries. And we've got to see that reality of iterative uh, failure in the business. And, and that's that's a problem with the position that that uh, prosecutors or child protection workers are in. They feel they just can't afford one mistake. But if civil society people are trying the initiative, if they fail, you know, political leaders will say, oh, they're a bunch of idiots for doing that. If they succeed, the leaders will take it over and say, oh, they are. <laughs> That's the way it works. I have a question from the Zoom. Um, can you describe an example of restorative environmental justice in, in Australia? What was the issue? Who was involved? What were the key steps? What was the outcome? Is there a model case that can provide such an example? Well, we've had some interesting river cases and we've had interesting river reform in Australia and, and New Zealand where the law has changed as a result of the case. So that's, you know, we're looking for structural reform. We're a 
you know, uh, where the law makes it clear that a river is not something that anyone owns, nor is a river, uh, it's not an object, it's not a possession, it's a flow of life. And, uh, and it's a flow of indigenous life for traditional owners of the land across which rivers flow. And so there's a need for Western law to learn from indigenous wisdom about the character of uh, rivers uh, as flows of life that should have standing in our law. I think those kind of uh, cases have been most profound, led by indigenous leadership, the door being opened by restorative engagement that allows the indigenous players to participate in the circle, the indigenous community participating in the river cleanup and working with the corporation responsible for the pollution in the river on the cleanup and leading the corporation. So indigenous leadership leads to legislative leadership uh, in, in those uh, uh, cases. The Wanganui River case is the, in New Zealand is the really important one there. Um, but there are cases that are good stories to tell. Uh, we had a case in Grafton in northern New South Wales where a, a municipal council worker cut down a scar tree. And scar trees are, are trees where canoes are cut out of the bark of the tree. These are such a valuable, precious resource because one day all of those trees will die and we won't have that heritage. So to actually cut one down, and in this case was particularly bad because the, uh, the, the council workers were so untrained in Indigenous responsibilities to the land that they cut with their chainsaws right through, you know, at least the part of the tree that had been preserved and put in a museum or something, but they cut right through uh, where the scar tree had been cut out for the canoe. And it was proceeding through the courts in a regular way, and Indigenous leadership from Grafton took the leadership, went, went to restorative justice uh, uh, advocates and pitched to the courts uh, that the Indigenous, you know, you might have sort of, the, the prosecutor might have already settled a deal with the council on this, but we're not happy about what we're hearing about that deal. So, you know, we want standing in this case. We want we want the case to be done. We want to we want to enter the courtroom and put our case. They uh, they uh, they did, and there was agreement about a lot of things that would be done to transform practices of councils around Australia. So, you know, any Australian should know what a scar tree looks like. You know, and council workers with armed with chainsaws to cut down trees particularly should know what they look like. You know, that's deadly, simple, preventive uh, protection of Indigenous uh, heritage. So a lot of those things were done. And, you know, perhaps more importantly than that, that was reinforced by a big ritual in Grafton uh, where the mayor spoke and apolog apologised with uh, deep sincerity and she, she, she wept and could not hold herself together during the ritual, there was a lot of indigenous dance and song uh, at the uh, uh, at the ceremony. You know, I think that's something we learn from the indigenous uh, North America that I love about the Museum of the American Indian in Washington D.C. That the you know our way of thinking about history. It's on the fourth floor. There. You know, me, that you know our way of thinking about history is it was contracted by we saw that. That's it. We find clever ways of walking away from it. But the uh, North American indigenous way of thinking about it is that we need to reaffirm that with regular meetings at which there is song and dance and giving of gifts to the parties and giving fine speeches about how you're going to build on the future, build it into something better rather than tear it down into something worse. So these cases where we draw that indigenous wisdom into the mainstream of Western law, I think, are the most profound cases. Oh, okay. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let's go. Um, first of all, thank you again for making the trip to Vermont to talk with us. Um, I listening to you speak, you know, it's really clear that RJ requires a paradigm shift um, and buy in from the two key stakeholders. And you brought up a lot about the importance of social movement. Um, one thing that I think about a lot, and Bill McKibben came here last week to talk with us about the sense of urgency that environmental issues have. And so when we're thinking about this intersection of restorative justice and environmental justice, um, and then having that pressure of just like time and like when you shouldn't do that with RJ, also like the beauty of RJ is that it, it operates on a different time. So I guess my question to you is, is the key way to get buy-in from a mainstream that like hasn't really like used restorative processes to address these issues? Is it social movement? Is that the, the way to get a buy-in? Or are there other strategies that we can like seep into the habits that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I, I think restorative justice can speed up the environmental uh, response. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a story. Uh, we had a big uh, a coal fired power plant for Hunt Coal, really terrible. One of the worst power plants, it would be a huge one too, in the world, in the state of uh, uh, Victoria. And if it had you know, the, they would dig the brown coal from the side of the power plant and take it in the plant. And then, if, you know, it's a bushfire area and there were always little fires starting around the place. And the coal mine was repeatedly catching fire, creating minor incidents. And everyone was predicting there would be 300 of these accidental fires and in the process of digging the coal. And it was a a uh, major disaster uh, waiting to happen. And eventually the whole massive brown coal mine caught fire and couldn't be put out for months. Basically, most of the town had to be evacuated. I mean, it was a huge environmental catastrophe. It was a big prosecution case. The criminal prosecution took a long time and it got pathetic uh, penalties. Um, you know, one of these cases where the company earns worldwide earns something like $90 billion a year and, and the fine was $10 million or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, a case like that, you know, there was an opportunity. There was a reforming CEO who was subsequently uh, the, the, the pose to, in the aftermath of this catastrophe, was brought in to approve the company's environmental act. I mean, I think that if she had been brought in to meet with the people of the town, they said that what, what they wanted was to just close not only this brown coal fire station, but others nearby and have a major investment which your company, or given what it has done to our community, ought to fund a major renewables uh, production facilities in our region to create employment uh, in our in our town, that she would have brought that pitch, but instead of that kind of restorative process, they went ahead with the standard criminal prosecution and the Rizri fine. So that would have been a, 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 you know, a case where there could have been speed up, I, I think, of closure of coal fire power plants as a as an outcome. But I I do think that standard law, formal law enforcement will be too slow. I do think uh, putting prices on carbon will be slow. And in a sense where the Chinese have got it right is that there needs to be state regulatory forcing that says you must, you must close all of these uh, coal-fired power plants by a certain date. You must, uh, the car industry uh, must stop producing um, uh, gasoline powered automobiles within X years. There needs to be state forcing to get there on time, I think. And that, but that's a demand that comes from social movement politics as well. Robert, well, maybe one more, and then we'll also have time following this. Yeah. So 
I do think so, and that's why I mentioned the Deepwater Horizon case. So, I, you know, I think uh, a, a huge limitation uh, of contemporary corporate realities is that corporations, big corporations have transnational coherence. Prosecutors, regulators only have national coherence. But social movement politics, the social movement for restorative justice, the environmental movement, they have a kind of transnational coherence uh, uh, to them. We were sort of talking about that today. And so uh, while Australia can only do something about uh, an oil spill on its territory, it can say, look, there's going to be some consequences that you won't like in terms of how we do the prosecution, how we work with the social movement that we're engaging in this restorative justice case to make sure that there's a lot of adverse publicity for the Halliburton Corporation and the principal cor uh, corporate uh, owner worldwide. Uh, and therefore, you would do better uh, to work with us in doing this survey of all your oil platforms around the world. Yeah, we know that in the other 40 countries in which you have rigs, we have no jurisdiction over it. We can see that and you can you can stand on your dicks and say, okay, will, will you just do the prosecution in court? But we just think this would be better for you because we'll give you favorable publicity if you do it really well. Uh, and we think it would be better for the planet. And we'll get it all over quickly. And you, you know, your CEO will be able to get back more quickly to the business of making money. And we'll be able to move more quickly to do something about the saving the planet transnationally. So yes, is my answer. Incredible talk, and um, thank you all for joining today. Again, we welcome you to stay. If you have additional questions. Please eat this food so we don't have leftovers. And um, truly, thank you for coming all this way to Vermont and hope that this sparks continued conversation in the state and, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.